Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello from beautiful, sunny San Diego. You're listening to Human Factors Cast. It's uh, February 4th, 2019, episode 119. Hello, Blake. How are you? Good. It's the rainiest San Diego's it's, ever been. Yeah, it's beautiful, sunny San Diego. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we have we have nothing to complain about because of the polar, no. polar vortex. You see that? D- yes, I have. It's terrifying. I think it's kind of intense. It's a little nuts. You've been keeping up with all the videos? No, I haven't. Oh, my gosh. So there's some there's some uh, videos of like people going outside, so... Uh, it's like the freezing the pants. Yeah, thing. one person's yoga yeah. pants, and they like threw it up and stuck straight in the snow. Uh, there's also the video of like all the all the um, I guess evaporation coming off of uh, the lake. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lake Mich- Lake Michigan up there is just like evaporating off of it. Um, there's another one where a woman like wet her hair and she went outside and it's all sticking straight up because it froze instantly. And of course, you get all the like. The videos of the eggs where they freeze and yeah, it's it's crazy. Pretty nuts, man. It's crazy. Our, our uh, that yeah. I mean, good on you if you're surviving out there right now because that's a uh, that's a that's a crazy thing to uh, sort of have to survive. Um, <laughs> Pretty nuts phenomenon going yeah. on. Yeah. If I didn't say it already, my name is Nick Rome. I'm joined by Blake Arnsdorf. Uh, we got some stuff to talk about today. Uh, we're gonna get into this. Ford is letting some designers, why only some, build cars in VR. Uh, Britain's Gatwick Airport. We've seen them in the news a little bit. Oh, we have with the drones <laughs> over the past <laughs> yeah, year. Yeah, sure. They are uh, experimenting with robot valets to park cars, so that'll be that'll be a fun thing to kind of explore. Uh, doctors zap the brains away of awake brain surgery patients to make them laugh and have fun. Nothing better than having fun while having surgery. Right? Uh, yeah, and uh, why captchas have gotten so difficult. So we got a lot of fun things. Uh, but first, uh, programming notes. Typically, towards the beginning of a new year, we pick up a few of you so welcome new listeners if you're new um you can find us also in addition to being on your favorite podcatcher of choice we are also on youtube and we do post new videos uh every tuesday around noon pacific and just in case you don't know if you want to go back and relive some of the classics we've been posting some of our classics um, indeed some of our bonus coverage up there on that YouTube platform uh, with the hopes to slowly roll out over the over the course of, you know, the next year to kind of backfill all of our older episodes. So that way you can enjoy Human Factors cast wherever you're at uh, on whatever platform you so desire. Um, Blake, we got something new this week. What do we got, Nick? Well, uh, so look, in the past we've done these giveaways. So last year we gave away uh, admission to... Uh, HFES uh, 2018 yeah. Right? yeah and then most recently we gave away uh, a, a year of um, HFES year of membership, membership right? yeah and now we are giving away admission to the HFES healthcare symposium 2019 oh so, man where is that when is that Nick so that is uh, a good question but it's March 24th through the 27th at the Hilton in Chicago so uh, it's in Chicago this year, so hopefully it won't be freezing polar vortex. You see, it's all connected. That's why I brought that up. That, that time uh, of the year, I don't know. It's going to be cold. That's yeah, sure. it will be cold. But hopefully, you know, some of our listeners can go. Uh, it's still we're still unsure if Blake and I will actually go. We might have some coverage there, though. Still working out the kinks. But, uh, you know, we are opening up a, a, a contest. So y- you can win admission to the 2019 Human Factors an ergonomics healthcare symposium, um, man. If you're not familiar, uh, these these conferences can offer a lot to you if you're fresh in your career, or even if you're, uh, you know, more experienced in your career. I think these conferences can offer you a lot. Specifically, the healthcare symposium um, really is a good opportunity for you to network if this is kind of the field that you want to get into. Um, or even even if you're just peripherally interested in human factors in healthcare, because you get to see a lot of human fact or more more so healthcare industry people there, like people from the FDA, people yeah. from actual companies. It's not really only centered around human factors, just like HFES would be. Right. It's a little more applied. You get to mingle with a lot of different people, learn a lot. There are things going on in healthcare, from you know stuff that's going on in the hospital room to devices being created. Yeah, because you went last year. I did. Yeah, I crashed a couple of sessions last year, and Elise actually went, who may be there this year for us. But she went last year, and you know met a lot of people, and went to a lot of interesting talks. 
Um, I didn't get to go to as many, but it was it was a fun experience nonetheless. Yeah. I, so like I said, we'll see if we can get some coverage out of it, whether that's interviews, whether that's uh, actual just, you know, what some of our traditional coverage, like, uh, you know, just attending talks or whatever. We'll try to get something for you. Um, and if you're going and want to share your experience on the show, please reach out to us. We're happy to have you on the show to have you talk about your experience. We always are, are welcoming to that kind of uh, that kind of content. Um, additionally, uh, I think they released some of their tracks and and everything. I just want to read this blurb really quick. The symposium offers leading human factors experts, pharmaceutical and medical device companies biomedical engineers, healthcare prof- providers, FDA representatives, and patient safety researchers the opportunity to discuss real-world examples and experiences and find solutions for issues and challenges in healthcare. Uh, so a lot of interesting things coming out of there, um, for sure. Um, Blake, if I seem... If my voice seems to cut off every now and then, that's because I am just coming over a cold from the last week. You saw it. Yeah, uh, definitely. Try to stay away from it. <laughs> uh, my office was basically quarantined. Thankfully, I was you know stuck only in a in a conference room for basically the whole week, uh, putting together a workflow. But man, I have to tell you, this is uh, it's like one thing after the other. I don't know if I mentioned my ankle last week. Did I mention that? I don't know if you talked about it all on the regular show. Anyway, yeah. So here's what happened, guys. It was my birthday weekend, and during my birthday weekend, I tripped and fell. My ankle was sprained. Maybe broke. I don't know. Uh, and it hurt really bad. So I was on I was on the couch for the rest of the weekend, just recovering. And then, you know, wouldn't you know it, the next week, I get sick. I get yeah, just s- kind of out of nowhere in the middle of the week, too. Out right? of nowhere in the middle of the week. One of our colleagues came back from a work trip, and he thinks he's the culprit, but I don't know. Anyway, so now me and my partner are sick. We're at home. We're sick. Uh, and then yesterday, I get the worst food poisoning of my life, and I don't even know if it was food poisoning, but like I just had this really intense like pain in my upper stomach, and it's just like one thing after the next. I'm waiting for the next boot to drop. Um, although someone said it comes in three, so I don't know. I'm just I'm feeling awful. So if that's if I can't quite make coherent thoughts tonight, that's why. That's all right. We'll get through it nonetheless. <laughs> we will get through. It'll it. It'll be all right, Nick. But that's going on with me. What's going on with you, Blake? Man, not a whole lot. This weekend was a little bit more eventful than I expected it to be. So one of our coworkers actually told me about a uh, local Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournament that was all, like, going to charity for cancer research. So I had gone to their website and signed up to volunteer because it's, it's like, two things that are kind of vastly important in my life or have been in the past, like, year or so. Uh, so I thought I'd kind of give back to the community and whatnot. And so I had no idea what I was going to be doing in terms of volunteering, I thought I'd be like maybe checking people in, answering questions if people had them and they walked up to you type of thing. Did you get up in jujitsu? No. What I actually did was I ended up <laughs> scoring jujitsu matches. Oh. Yeah, so for How does that work? Okay, so hang on. For the uninitiated, describe jujitsu. Okay, so it's basically wrestling in your pajamas. No, not really. So it's it the name of the game is basically you're trying to either get points or you're getting points through trying to in no other way than choke somebody. So, I mean, that's what it is. It's a martial that's art. That's jiu-jitsu. Yeah, it's a you're martial art. You're trying to art. choke. So, like, if I if I were to choke you, I'd be jiu-jitsuing. No. Okay. Not, not the way you would probably <laughs> go about it. Uh, but, yeah, so there's like there's no real striking. There's only, like, takedowns, and then it's it's basically a lot of grappling on the ground. Okay. And so there's there's various points and stuff like that that – get accrued for that but i have to say like the value of having a really cleanly designed interface is so important for so many things but for this opportunity where it was like a handful of 10 people who volunteer their time for a day not really knowing what they were going to be doing maybe didn't have any experience of like either watching jujitsu or knowing how to score it right there was this particular company and i can't remember the name of it i'll have to look it up later but they provide like a touchscreen interface that you can basically watch all the refs calls and make the determinations that you need to make using a web-based app and so Hmm. basically me and 10 other people were able to learn how to use this thing and all the nuances of creating brackets because this is like from little kids all the way to like full adults Um, they were going throughout this tournament throughout the day so we were able to help set up brackets you know, score matches, save matches, and make determinations like if a ref kind of changed his mind at the end of the match and that kind of stuff. 
so it was really a cool experience not just for the fact that it was like supporting a good cause but to see that there's like technological solutions that are even being thought about in sports that i really haven't gotten to interact with oh sure cool yeah i mean sports is huge for human factor stuff right oh yeah it's it's kind of nuts and it's just not something i i assumed you would need like professional people scoring these things um but based on like ref calls and stuff it's all very automated Hmm. not that intense that's interesting yeah so it's cool yeah fun Hey, I want to touch on one more thing before we get into the Human Factors News of the Week. What you got, Nick? Well, uh, you know what? If you're considering being a Patreon supporter, right now is a good time to get in. And let me tell you why. So, Blake and I have been kicking around this idea. We're going to do sort of this mini-series, if you will. Uh, we, we ran it past a couple of our Patreon subscribers right now. It sounds like a pretty cool idea, and... Uh, like I said, if you're thinking about getting in, right now is the time. So we're going to do sort of this mini series, uh, taking a look at the American space program through the lens of human factors, um, and we're gonna we're gonna take several kind of fictional movies and and kind of slam them together. Uh, so we're thinking like the right stuff, human figures or hidden figures. Sorry, uh, I'm, I'm thinking human factors. Um, Hid- hidden figures, human factors. Uh, First Man, Apollo 13, a couple documentaries that some of our other Patreons have, uh, have suggested. Um, so if you're at all interested in space, this would be a good opportunity to jump in, hear our commentary. Uh, we're putting this together as a package piece. So, um, you know, over the next, I guess, couple months, we'll be throwing these out there uh, with the hope to do more mini series like this. It's, it's kind of a fun thing. So if you're thinking uh, about being a Patreon supporter, now is the time. No right. time like the present. No time like the present. All right, Blake, you ready for this next thing? What's the next thing? All right. Well, it's Human Factors News. It's time to get into that part of the show where we talk about everything related to the field of human factors. This could be anything from we got some medical in there, some transportation in there, uh, psychology, AI, whatever it is, virtual reality even, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we have up first this week? Oh, man. So like Nick mentioned earlier, Ford's looking into possibly designing cars in virtual reality. So the automaker has started experimenting with Gravity Sketch, a tool that allows its designers to draw 3D cars in virtual reality and thereby saving them lots of time in the process. So typically, vehicle designers start with 2D sketches, which are scanned and rendered in 3D by software to determine their feasibility. While using 3D Sketch, however, this gives designers the power to skip that first step completely and dive right into 3D development. All they have to do is actually wear a VR headset and use a controller to render some of their own designs. So this will apparently shave off so much time off of the design phase that what used to take up to weeks will only take a few hours. So using a 3D drawing tool, designers will be able to work from any angle since they can just rotate the model for best viewing with the VR controller. And they can even step inside the 3D model and tweak elements once they see the dri- once they see the driver or passenger's point of view. So this is pretty sick by Ford to kind of jump into taking on this new project. In a- but it's also like a nice implementation of VR that's saving the company a lot of money, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, you, you read it right there in the blurb. You know, it's shaving off weeks, if not months at a time of this design process for, for these guys to get in guys and gals to get in and, uh, you know, just whip up. It's like one of the underrated tools that we have as professionals is a pen and pencil. And, you know, cause we can draw a concept on a piece of paper and save a lot of time. Cause it's a lot easier to show something and say, Hey Blake, what do you think of this? Do you know where to click next? You know? And, and, um, the way that they're showing this is, you know, they're, they're shaving off time in the sense that they are doing that 3D sketch to get buy in. Right. They, they don't have to uh, show several different angles on a 2D piece. They can visualize the thing in 3D. They can smooth out surfaces. They it, it's basically like providing them exactly with the tools they need to make these really more fully fleshed out uh mock-ups if you will they're 3d mock-ups of of a car um and so i think that's really cool yeah it's it's interesting because i mean over time i would assume if you build up a library of these kind of things if you're making an update like a 20 you know 2020 update to a car that was built in 2019 you could use the base model and that's a place you could start from even if you're not planning on making drastic changes to a model 
Um, so I mean, that even starts saving more time over over like progressions of cars. So you have like some base place to start off of, and it's it's interesting that it even take it does take that long to do the two D sketches. Where in this case, if you're able to jump into three D, you could even have you know who knows the board members hop in and put VR goggles on themselves and look at what the car is like, or start like getting people inside of the car and get their insights into like how things are laid out from the passenger side or the driver side. Yeah, so one really important piece of this is going to be how does this control in the virtual environment, right? I, I haven't used Gravity Sketch uh, personally, uh, but it looks like, you know, it'll give you, and if you develop it, uh, Ford will not only use assets they, that they've created, but allow some for scre- free sketch, right? So it it's all integrated. You can, like, make this free sketch tool to sh- give you, like, a rough profile of the, of the vehicle, and then from there, you can almost like toss assets onto it, right? Like think about a human operator in this vehicle. Would they even realistically be able to fit given the specifications that you've sketched out, right? And maybe maybe scaling, right? So, okay, my sketch is pretty tiny so, and this human is rather large, but I can scale it and then fit it in. So that way you can blow up the whole thing to scale. And then you have like um, basically a car there in your, yeah. in your 3D space, which is really neat. They just uh, likely you just I guess feed that to uh, the manufacturing robots and they could build it for you. Uh, yeah, well, we'd hope it would be that easy, right? You know, if it's yeah. Just a I would assume that's of... where the integration might go. Like, let's say this is super successful for Ford because I think they're only testing it like across certain um, certain facilities. I don't think everywhere is doing it. Right. Uh, well, I mean, it'd be very easy to make little changes, right? Like, let's say you have a casting that needs to change for the next year's model or something. Sure. Um, you could make that change really easily and then just feed it to the caster and then it will put everything together. You know, if it uses the same chassis or something, I, I don't know how cars work. I don't claim to know, but that's in my head, the simplistic view that I hold. Yeah. I mean, um, maybe it's that simple, but definitely shaving off this much time. I think it allows you, it probably allows designers to make up, like make a few more assessments, maybe even test out some of their concepts and more high fidelity and stuff like that. So it's cool, cool technology for sure. Yeah. And, a, and it, seems like it's i don't know somewhat intuitive looking looking at the videos watching them kind of being able to use both hands to almost draw like as if you're drawing like a draft sketch yeah um i think the biggest piece of this to me is the fact that they are investing in design and they know that it's so important and that design takes time and they're trying to accelerate that by giving them tools that they'll use to help you know facilitate a quicker turnaround on these things. And that could be dangerous right down the line if, if they ex- come to expect a certain cadence when it comes to design, but I hope not. I hope they are uh, at least knowledgeable about design takes time and, and even with different tools, uh, you know, it, it could not, it, it might not be as fast as they're thinking. Yeah. I think the, I think initially though, just because they're cutting that large amount of time from going from just 2d into 3d i think that's just enough hopefully for people at ford to just say like okay well at least we're losing this much time uh and we're getting more productive designs out of it now Uh, i mean i think it's just a win for both ford and the designers that work there being able to work in 3d yeah um i just realized uh by the way before we get into our new next news story i never told our listeners how to uh get into that contest and that's intentional that's intentional. You have to stick around till the end of the episode. I just, I just didn't want you to think that we forgot about you. You got to stick around to the end of the episode. That you do. <laughs> All right, Blake. What's up next? All right. So, a mechanical go getter of the of a robot named Stan will now be valeting cars at London's Gatwick Airport this summer. So the robots are built by a French company called Stanley Robotics, who started developing self-parking cars before realizing that it made more sense to move all the complex AI and hardware from something that spends most of its time parked and immobile into something that only parks cars and can do that all the time. So the result was Stan, a robot designed to actually lift and move cars into parking spaces without the need for the car to be activated at all. So Stan... Stan robots work by lifting cars by their wheels and parks it somewhere in a vast, dense parking lot. Cars can be parked closer to each other because robots really just don't need as much room to maneuver. And so, of course, doors don't have to be opened when the cars have been parked by Stan the robot. So this is a crazy looking design to me, but it makes a whole lot of sense. They're they're getting away from 
okay, let's just have the car park itself versus let's create something that'll actually make this simpler for the time being. Yeah, so this is this is important on a couple levels, right? First, it is saving space in these in these really busy airport parking lots. Like you said, operators or, or valet drivers or anybody doesn't even have to be there to open up the door. So these robots can just place them right where they need to be. Uh, additionally, you can stack them x x deep because you know that there could be multiple you know robots that can just in a line come and take the first five cars and then the sixth car is yours and pull it out right so like there's there's a variety of ways that this will help efficiency and the at least the concept shows everything behind this kind of locked garage door so you'd get out um of the garage the garage door would close and then it would come and take your stuff so you didn't have to worry about your valuables being in the car because there's theoretically no humans on the other side except for potentially maybe some supervisor um so I really like this idea. Uh, I, I'd feel a whole lot. I, I'm always sketchy about valets. I don't know about you. Um, I've n- I mean, I've never had anybody joyride my car, but I certainly have had friends that have had their cars kind of like taken and scratched up and stuff like that. So I mean, I'm never that big of a fan. But at the same at the same time, I mean, something like this, I I, I don't know. It would make it a lot easier and much simpler going to the airport and just like le- like let's say you were in a rush. And you didn't take an Uber or a Lyft, and you just had to get to the airport. Just dropping this thing off at valet and letting it put it wherever it needs to be could save you a lot of time and get you on a plane that you might miss otherwise. Yeah, and additionally, like think about coming off that plane instead of sitting around and waiting for an Uber. Maybe it could link up to some of the services that say, "Hey, your flight's going to get in at this time," and it knows to start getting that thing ready, uh, moving the cars in front of yours, so that way it can have your car ready by the time you're there. Yeah, right? potentially. To go- just goes ahead and starts moving it when your plane lands. Exactly. So you're right. already ready to get in your car and leave. You don't have to worry about waiting for it or any of that kind of stuff. Exactly. Can you imagine if it just brings it right up to the curb for you? Like, Oh, that'd be in, so fun. In this concept, it shows a garage, right? So I'd imagine that you'd go back to the garage and have to swipe some card to get back into your car. Probably, uh, Because yeah. of security reasons, right? Like, you know, security you get a, you get a token. An easy way to, like, pay and all that kind of stuff, too, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, but I I really like this idea. I I really like this idea. I, it's pretty cool that it's or I was surprised actually that I guess it's been used in France for a little while at least, or the concept has, and now it's coming to Gatwick this soon. Like that's only a few months away before they start trying to implement it. So it'll be awesome to see how that goes. Yeah. Uh. So, yeah, I don't know what else to say about this other than uh, can we get it here in the states because that would be amazing. Yeah, it makes me want to take a trip uh, across the pond just to go take a look at it when they deploy it because it the robots look really cool. Yeah, it's got like this anthropomorphic face, yeah, little a little bit, little bit of personality to it. Yeah, it just picks up the front of your wheels and drags your car to where it needs to be. Epic, man. Yeah, that's Great really design. neat. All right, well, uh, you know what? We'll be back to break down the other news stories. But first, we're going to give you this little thing. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Yeah, uh, just to remind everybody, right now is a great time to get on the Patreon train uh, because of that mini series that we are putting together. So before we uh, jump into the rest of our stories, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Gizmodo, Engadget, Jalopnik, and The Verge for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join our Slack for links to the original articles. We post those as we find them and even source some of them from you guys. So, you know. If you if you want to send some our way, we're happy to uh, we're happy to talk about them. Uh, 
All right, Blake, we got two more for today. What do we got up next? Oh, man, this one's really, really interesting. So some forms of brain surgery require patients to be awake and responsive, which is a rather unsettling proposition even for the bravest among us. So neuroscientists have now devised an ingenious way of reducing fear and anxiety during these delicate procedures by electrically stimulating a part of the brain that triggers laughter and good feelings. So when when electrically stimulated, the cingulum bundle pathway triggers instantaneous laughter in the patient. But unlike previous experiments, this laughter is also accompanied by positive, uplifting feelings. So preliminary research suggests this technique could be used to calm patients during awake brain surgery, with the author saying that the findings could also lead to innovative new treatments for depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. Now, Nick, this is something I was really interested in when I was an undergrad was neuroscience. And so anytime we pull up these kind of articles, I got really excited because seeing how the field progresses is just really awesome. But can you imagine having to go through one just like at a or have you ever had to go through a surgery where you had to be awake for it i yes i have um i'm not going to talk about it on this show that's fine <laughs> hey, that's fine no i will problem. talk to you offline about it because it is it is interesting <laughs> it is an interesting surgery that's an infinite uh, one. you know what yeah it, well i don't even know if it's infinite <laughs> if you're really interested please reach out to me on slack but it is not something i feel comfortable talking about on this show Excellent. uh so yes i have um not open brain surgery, though. And so I don't know how this surgery how that translates to it. Yeah. Yeah. How this translates to that. But I mean, just being awake during surgery itself is kind of like you, you try to focus on other things. And if you had some sort of tool to help you like just feel good, I, this is almost like like drugs, but stimulating like electro drugs. Yeah. No, in a it's way, kind of like right? it's like. I don't know, drugs without, well, I don't know if it has no consequence, but drugs really without consequence, right? Because you're just, it's just stimulating your own brain. Yeah. Yeah. And just getting, (laughs) getting the pathways to do what they normally would do. If you feel these sensations. So I think it's a really awesome advent. And I, I wonder, I wonder how this would affect a lot of different types of, you know, depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. Like they talk about at the end, because I mean, I could see that just being another way that you can kind of try and try and hack the brain so that it feels a certain way, or maybe it opens the pathway or makes it, you know, more susceptible to being open, like whether you're laughing or having uplifting feelings, whatever it may be. Yeah. I mean, the whole biochemistry of the brain is, is difficult to mess with. And I mean, especially for anxiety, depression, those types of things. Sure, yeah. Uh, the chemical balance can do weird things to your brain. Certainly, right? yeah. And so, so the more you get away from that, and the more you can treat the brain with just electrical stimulation, like that's all this is, is masking the pain through electrical stimulation and also causing good feelings. Um, so I don't, I don't know if they're actually masking the pain. Did the article say anything about masking pain, or is it just? Uh, that is a really good point. It just mentions that it's stimulating the particular pathway that makes you feel laughter and good feelings. I don't know if it numbs the pain or anything like that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're able to tap into those same types of pathways and dull the senses of pain. I'm going to read a Especially quote Especially for here. like under, if you're going through something that's just brain surgery. I'm going to read a, a quote here. I think this is by uh, Bijanki, who's one of the... Um, Who's, who's one of the neurosurgeons here. They said, uh, despite a high level of education and insight and despite adequate preparation for the operating room, uh, when he woke up from the initial anesthesia required for the first stage of operation, opening his cranium and exposing the brain, he panicked and reacted so violently that he pulled his head loose from the skull pins meant to keep his head stable. The operation became unsafe because he would not remain still. We had to put him back to sleep, and then we were only able to safely remove part of the tumor because we lost the ability to map the border between the critical language function and the tumor. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so that is some incra- crazy... That's a crazy story, right? Which would... Um, if, you, if you could imagine just pressing a button and having the artificial dopamine, good feelings, release, and, and you're protecting the patient from, from waking up from anesthesia, uh, from feeling like they're panicked. Um It'd be interesting. So this is stimulating good feelings, but it's not inhibiting panic. Yeah, so it's not I, inhibiting pain either. 
yeah so i wonder if you know y- y- you would wake up from this thing and then sort of feel anxious but happy anxious like you know when you get like really nervous you laugh uh i wonder if it's the same type of thing and i gotta say like watching these videos of these people in surgery who are smiling like is a little unsettling like you see the yeah uh, you see the big uh uh, what do they call that? The sheet that protects the view from the brain. So if you're watching this on our on our YouTube channel, there's there's no not safe for work things in here. It's not graphic at all. It's it's um, just somebody behind the veil who's who's smiling, and and you can see brain waves too, uh, in conjunction with the person smiling. It's it's all very unsettling, knowing that their their skull is open and somebody's operating on them right now, <laughs> like. Uh, I yeah, don't know. I'm kind of surprised with because like with laughter, I don't and I don't know. Obviously, they can or I'm assuming they can probably oscillate the electrical signal so that maybe it's not as powerful in some places versus others. But I'd be worried about like patients like myself laughing too hard or something and moving, moving. Yeah. Moving um, the pins that are supposed to keep it in place. Yeah, that's that's crazy. So or maybe that's the point is they just want you to feel good. So you maybe you'll follow the instructions that you're supposed to of like not moving kind of like the story that you just read about or the quote that you read about where it was the guy kind of panicked and started freaking out a little bit versus in this case, you might be more calm. But I don't know. It's, yeah, it's it, a, it's a cool <laughs> technique for sure. It is kind of unsettling to watch just because it's, it's you're controlling somebody's joy. It's really weird. Yeah. It's a little strange. If you could like, if you could turn my face into a smile just with a button, like a laugh and smile, it's like, it's weird because these people are describing like tightness in their mouth after laughing. Uh, and they they don't have control over it. And it's, that is weird to me that you just don't have control over your, over your functions. Yeah, Just oh, <laughs> man. That, the, one of the questions that come up is, like, uh, right here, When if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see this, but patient gets asked, do you think you could frown right now? And I think her answer is no, because she's getting that electrical shock. Yeah. Um, which has great implications, right? Because, like we talked about with depression or anxiety, that could do great <laughs> things for you. They're asking her to think of something sad. And she <laughs> can't even do it. And she's oh, laughing man. about whatever's sad. And she's trying to think of her dog dying. Oh, that's horrifying. <laughs> she's Jeez. laughing about it, and it's not working. Well, let me just change your... That just can change your entire outlook on anything. Yeah, and she's... It's weird, because, yeah, you mentioned it. She's not even recalling these as sad memories, and they don't even feel sad to her in this moment. So I wonder if this had some long-term impacts on memory, where if you could try to remember... Your brain. Yeah, you could. Nice. So I don't know. There's a lot of... There's a lot of things with this that uh, are unsettling to me on a superficial level. Well, but there's more ethical questions to it than I guess I would have expected. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why I love these deep dives with you, Blake. We always t- tend to pull out these ethical issues in all these, all these uh, advancements. Still pretty cool, though. I mean, I can't, I can't say anything too bad about it because, I mean, if you, can, if you can avoid stories like the guy was telling that like somebody's trying to get out of the chair basically while the surgery is going on to their brain. Yeah. And then lose all like your, the hard work that you've get done of trying to map the brain and make sure you don't, you know, ruin any parts of their like functional life. Right. Um, well, Hey, maybe with enough electrical stimulation, that memory could no longer be a bad memory. They could rewrite it to be something they laugh it's about. Very true. This is how um, you start rewriting and, brains. And maybe someone could rewrite my surgery to make it something I will laugh about. I'll tell you about it yeah. as soon as, as soon as we hit stop. You heard it here <laughs> first on human factors <laughs> cast, rewriting your brain with electrical stimulation. Okay. We got one more story. What is up last? All right. So why has capture gotten so difficult? I don't know. It's dumb. Yeah. We just experienced it a few Yeah, we did. Ago. All right, so CAPTCHA test. So this is an acronym for Completely Automated Public Turing Test to tell computers and humans apart. It's insane. And they've reached so, some sort of a inscrutability inscrut- plateau. So in the early 2000s, we had simple images of text were enough to stump most of the spam bots that are out there. But about a decade later, after Google had bought this program from Carnegie Mellon, Mellon researchers and was utilizing it to digitize Google Books, text had to be increasingly warped and obscured to stay ahead of improving optical character recognition programs. Programs which, in a roundabout way, all of those human-solving CAPTCHAs were helping to improve. And by 2014, Google pitted one of its machine learning algorithms against humans and solving mo- the most distorted text CAPTCHAs. The computer got 
the test right about 99.8% of the time, while humans were scoring a mere 33% correct. But the problem with many of these tests isn't necessarily that the bots are too clever, it's that humans just normally suck at them. And it's not that humans are dumb, it's just that nature, it's just that humans are wildly diverse in language, culture, and experience. And once you get rid of all that stuff and try to make a test that any human can pass without any prior training or much thought, you're left with brute tasks like image processing, exactly the thing that TaylorMade AI is going to be good at. Man, so that makes sense why these have gotten so much more complicated, because it can't just be easy to do tests. Yeah, but, uh, be- because humans are dumb, right? That's that's ultimately what it comes. Well, to. There, no. there's so much nuance. <laughs> there's so much nuance to like who a human is that right. trying to make something so simple that's gonna you know work across cultures or across levels of experience. Yeah, it's, it's hard it, to do. It's almost like designing icons that are intuitive, right? Like the save icon, we know that from convention, right? But kids these days have never seen a floppy disk in their life. They just know it yeah. as the same save icon. Um, but likewise, you need to be able to convey danger, let's say, on a road when you don't understand the language of that country, um, you know, or vice versa, right? Somebody needs to understand caution, like, swervy road when they're here in the States. The, that same principle needs to be applied to captions. But by doing that, you're then making it super easy for the computer to process it. I think that's the trick, right? Yeah. I think they used to employ, or maybe they still do employ um, tactics where, you know, a computer will click on the center of an image every time. And maybe they've gotten around that by adding some randomization to the algorithm that, you know, looks at the space within the box and then clicks a random space. Because it used to be that computers used to click right in the middle of the center on those CAPTCHAs. And that would be a dead giveaway to Google or whoever has the CAPTCHA that you're a robot. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so I, I'd imagine the technology's gotten much better and that, you know, uh, robots can think around that now. And so, yeah, it's hard. How do you, how would you, what would be the human test? What Because ultimately that's what it is, is these robots are passing the Turing test when it comes to CAPTCHAs. Yeah, I mean, and I think the, the ultimate problem is, is there's the funny irony here that you can't make it very complicated if it's not going to frustrate people. Right. And if you, but if you go that route, you're just going to have people that can build spam bots that are easily able to trick your own, trick through the captions and make you maybe think it's a human. So what do you even do? But like, like you experienced earlier, I think it's gotten a little bit out of hand in what they've done in terms of how many times you have to go through a process to identify right. images and what, what's really dictating that, okay, we know you're a human now. Um, Versus sometimes I don't know if that's only what they're doing versus they're trying to make you do some basically image processing for them. Yeah, that's that's another flip side to this whole argument, right? Is that are they using your human fed data to help a machine learn what like, you know, like you see the the pictures of the road. What's a crosswalk? What's a what's a road sign? What's a vehicle? And they're turning all those images into data that they then feed to their self-driving cars or that they sell to self-driving car manufacturers. And so it, yeah, it, it is this like weird game of like, you know, what's it, who's it for? And I think ultimately like thinking or going down that line of logic, like eventually something else has to, has to replace it because we're going to get to the point where it's just like, okay, they've gotten the amount of image recognition they can out of humans and, now that there's AI that can already process it, I'm sure that somebody else can tap into those libraries and start tricking those captures. So you're ultimately there's got to be something else that allows you to kind of prove that you are the person that owns this information or is trying to get into this stuff. Right. Because I mean, before it was like the weird string of text, right? God, I hated those. Oh, those those are awful. Like yeah. three C X J two V nine or whatever. And it'd be all jumbled. It'd be across the screen. And then you have, the newest invention, which is these pictures, right, where you're clicking on them. Yeah, on the grid where you have to identify, like, storefronts or, right. like, crosswalks, like you said. And then you go through what, how many iterations. I've had to go through, like, four. Yeah, I think the most I've done was four or five. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why, but I get so frustrated doing them. I do, too. And, it's, it's, and I shouldn't. I think, it's, I think sometimes it's because when they're using it to keep me safe, Sometimes that gets in the way of me trying to do something like trying to log in and pay my rent or something right. like that, right? 
I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think the future is like with biometrics. Like imagine you have, you have a heartbeat, you have a heart rate monitor on you, your Fitbit or whatever. Um, maybe you log in with like a, like a smart ring or something is like a two factor authentication where you, you touch it up to this dongle or whatever. And, and it reads your heart rate and says, okay, you're a human. Right. But I mean, that can be emulated too. So I don't even know. I don't even know where to go. Like yeah, in my there. head, like maybe blockchain is the answer to it because it creates just a distinct signature that you can trace back to. But I, I don't know. I don't understand the technology well enough to say that it could never be like victim to something, some kind of cybersecurity problem. Yeah. But apparently, that's I mean, that's what is so good about the the blockchain technology. But I don't really know what the solution is. But don't maybe. I don't think anybody so does. Images. I think there's one person who understands what you know, like blockchain could really do. Yeah, and you wrote a paper about it, and everybody's read it, and then they think they understand. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Speculating on the future of CAPTCHA, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe. I think it makes sense that it's gotten harder, though, because, yeah. I mean, we basically have taught AI to a certain degree to be able to at least do the things we were doing, so they have to keep making it harder. Yeah, and that kind of goes along with the... Uh, wh- what's that concept that this generation is smarter than the other? Oh, I don't know. It's it's some concept where, um, yeah. Well, because I mean, they have to keep redoing IQ tests every couple of years. Because if if a kid today were to take an IQ test from like the 1900s, they would score well above like 180 on it. So, oh, so there's some kind of effect that we were calling. Yeah. So every generation gets smarter, which makes sense. It does. Yeah. Uh, and and so I'm wondering if these captchas will have to evolve in the same way. But at a more rapid pace? I don't know. It's interesting. Probably, yeah, especially if we start doing things like, you know, integrating computers into your brain. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, people are... This, this is a, a wild debate right now, and I'm sorry I brought it up. The Flynn effect is what it's called. Oh. Uh, but... Uh, are we really getting smarter? Yeah, I don't know. That's a that's a good question, like too. Flynn. Anyway, uh, all right. Well, we have any other closing thoughts on those, or is it time to get into our favorite part of the show? Uh, we can get into our favorite part of the show. It came from. It came from. That's right. It came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. Uh, any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion among the community. Uh, all right. So, how many do we got today, Blake? We got one. We two? got one. We got one. All one. right. This week's a slow. This is like two weeks of slow Reddit questions. I'm gonna have to just start sourcing stuff outside. You know what? And we'll have to like pull from Slack too, because uh, y- yeah, yeah. Actually, another reason to join the. Well, I mean, you can get into the Slack no matter if you're a Patreon subscriber or not. But we love to answer questions in and out of the Slack. Yeah. Yes, we do. Um, there's a couple things we can pull from the Slack to to talk about anyway cyber shoes all right this first one here is by uh, it, uh this one again really blake that's the only thing that's in there that's even <laughs> this, worth this one again okay all right so this is by user snorgle um presumably on the human factor subreddit what is this one human factors subreddit all right uh are you guys ready for this one strap in strap in it's not like you haven't thought about this before oh geez all right so hey blake what is the difference between human factors and ux Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> what is? What are either one of those all things? All right, hang on. Snorgle goes on to write, Hi, all. I've seen this question asked before elsewhere. I haven't really encountered any concrete answers yet, so I thought I would try it here. Do you see a difference between human factors and UX in terms of focus, work, methods, products, etc., or do you just see them as a progression of different titles for pretty much the same job? I come, a, I come from a cognitive psych PhD background, and I sort of view human factors as one having more of an emphasis on applying scientific research in human behavior, cognition, and perception to design challenges, and two, dealing with more complex systems than you'd find in UX. Mm. However, I also recognize that I'm old and started out in human factors and am maybe simply resistant to this relatively newfangled UX term, which seems to encompass everything and will likely be the standard for describing the overall field soon. I still see UX work as focused more on websites and apps than on mission-critical systems, but maybe there are some who call themselves UX people as they work on vehicle command and control systems, healthcare systems, military and ATC systems, and whatnot. I love whatnot. And whatnot, yeah. I personally work on whatnot. and uh, I exclusively look for whatnot. <laughs> All right, Blake. Uh, 
what do you think? Human factors versus UX. What, what do you think? User snorkel. Uh, what do you think? Okay, first off, let's break this down. Um, let's answer this question by a question. Do you see a difference between human factors and UX in terms of focus, work, methods, products, etc.? I I feel like UX gets a is t- was at one point a very loaded term, and now it's becoming a little less loaded because now you'll see a lot of job applications or whatever are like UX researcher, UX designer. And UX researcher, I feel like, is much more in line with some of the stuff that you see a human factors engineer doing um, or a human factors scientist. Uh, oftentimes, some of those job posts will even be looking for somebody like like Snorgle himself who's got like a cog psych background or a cog psych PhD. So that's I think that's a little more in lines with the, a similar focus on like the work and the methods and maybe even some of the products that are produced. That's a little up in the air because UX does have its own set of type of products that you can create that are not necessarily something you're going to see a human factors engineer making on their own all the time. And vice versa, too. I mean, you see products that you uh, that human factors people put together that maybe UX professionals wouldn't. Yeah, like workflow is a perfect example. You right. have like 10,000 things that I want to call a workflow in UX, but really there's smaller pieces of it that don't capture the full picture, from right. my perspective anyway. Um, so I don't know. What do you? How do you see it for this first question? Do you? What's the biggest difference between the two? I think you hit it right on the head. I think the the research piece of the UX uh, bubble is is really the what's more analogous to human factors than anything, right? If you are classically trained in human factors, you're probably more research scientific focused um, and trying to pull in academic studies that then inform how you're going to. Um, how you're going to design it. You're almost like the liaison between the designer and, um, and the user, right? You're, you're almost that liaison between the developer designer and the users. I also think that human factors, um, I don't know, man, like maybe I, I haven't really worked a whole lot of UX positions. I've worked one and, I, I would say that access to users is a lot more prevalent in human factors than it is in UX. And I don't know if that's just because companies don't value UX and and their contribution. Like, I don't know, maybe it's getting better. Uh, I, I hope it's getting better. Oh, I think in a lot of ways it definitely is. I think you have, or in, in my experience when I was like more in the UX, that our UX position, I had a lot more power and access to users and people that might even potentially touch the system once it was deployed than I have as a human factors professional. Oh, well, because we're getting much larger sample sizes, like having the ability to plan like usability tests that were a little more, a little more in depth than what I've done as a human factors researcher. Um, so I, I feel like it's kind of a trade off and I think UX is growing a lot more. Like I was saying, like it used to be that when you said I'm hiring for a UX designer position, I wanted you to be able to do research usability testing understand psychology be able to design and maybe even be able to code and unicorn now that, now that yeah now that's gotten split up into more it's more like siloed pieces because i think most people are realizing that one person one can't do all of that feasibly by themselves and two it's much better to have a little bit of specialization in what you know what you're doing yeah let's tackle this middle piece here um Human factors work as one, having more of an emphasis on applying scientific research and human behavior, cognition, and perception to design challenges, and two, dealing with more complex systems than you'd find in UX. Um, so let's tackle point one. What do you think about that? Um, this is this is interesting. It'll be a, kind of a, can, a fun back and forth here. Yeah. So for one, I'm going to say, and again, this is my point of view, I guess. So having So you're having an emphasis on more applied scientific research. Yeah, I think that traditionally, doesn't mean this is every company out there, but I think traditionally, if you're a human factors researcher, engineer, you're going to be, you're going to have an academic background likely in most cases, especially if you have like a higher degree, whatnot. So maybe you're more up on current research, you're into some of the more psychology of what's going on behind and the studies that have been done as it relates to human behavior and maybe even concepts like situation awareness. So, yeah, I think you're going to have a lot more um, deep knowledge of psychology and the current stuff that's going on in academia. And in my opinion and what I've experienced is a lot of times when you interact with people that are just considering themselves somebody that's in UX, they understand 
the higher level principles of psychology and stuff that have to do with human behavior. And especially when it comes to how you interact with systems, are there colors that, you know, make you think of angry things, that kind of stuff, much more of like a higher level tier of understanding of psychology and human behavior. Whereas you'll have human factors. People, if you work in aviation, for instance, you might be very focused on, you know, what research has been done in the cockpit or in specific you know, psychological constructs that you deal with in teams and stuff like that. So I think there's just a, a different, a difference in the level. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, w- I want to talk about the second piece here. Sure. So dealing with more complex systems than you'd find in UX. And I feel like this is such a, uh, yeah, a pompous attitude. It's a real pompous attitude. Right. And yeah. I, I, okay. This is something that I absolutely hate about, um, let's say academia just in general how sort of what am I trying to say here I, I don't like how education is held to you know put on this pedestal and that you, you can never reach my level because I've been through various I've been through school and I have a PhD been through the wickets yeah and uh, like I, I think that's that's such a pompous attitude and and it kind of goes along with this dealing with more complex systems. Think about the UX designers and researchers that worked on Microsoft word and, or sorry, Microsoft office. That is an intensely complex system that solves, you know, a a specific task. It's not, it's not, you know, flying planes. It's not, um, developing technology for the military, but it is an insanely complex system that has to work together and because love it or hate it it works together very seamlessly and it's the seams that don't fit together so well that we tend to notice sure but think about all the other things in that product that do fit together and that do work well that do interoperate between excel and word and powerpoint um and the team had to do that and that was ux researchers and i would i would think that Calling that any less complex than, you know, a, a air traffic control system, I think, is, is selling it short. Yeah, and, I mean, th- some people might not agree with, like, this example, but this is something that's come up on, like, a recent podcast that I was listening to with the CEO of Twitter, right? Like, that is a very complex system that's run basically by machine learning and algorithms, But it's the UX research behind it that's allowed it to start making much more informed decisions based on the data that it feeds it, figuring out when when do I really have to bring a human into the loop? What do we need to change to make more people want to even adopt and use the platform? Like It's not as simple as that interface is. The things that are going on behind it to keep it working and keep a global conversation going across like millions of topics... I mean, that's taken UX researchers and designers to think about. It's not necessarily just a human factors person. I agree. And I think it's a testament, too, to how well these apps and programs work that we we think of them as simple because that's they're doing their job. Yeah, you can't even understand that it's complex because it doesn't feel that way. You don't right. have to think about the nuances that make something that complex. I mean, think about it, too. These, these organizations... Uh, have a lot of money to throw around too, like Mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter, they have a lot of money to throw at designers. And so they can focus on these very small little problems. And so maybe that's where this pompous attitude comes in, where maybe, maybe you are focusing on just a notification button and what's the most efficient notification button, but it feeds into this whole system. And there's somebody at a higher level than that. That's thinking about, well, what's the best way to alert users to come and engage with our platform? Like there's, there's a lot of stuff going on there and I don't want to like downplay it. I think, I think, uh, I agree with some of it, but the complex systems piece, I completely, I, I, I I'll push back. Yeah. Completely on that. Because also too, like if you think about any real enterprise piece of software, like something that Illumina's Lumina creates to do sequencing the, of the, what is it? Human genome. Oh yeah. I mean, a lot of the times so they're they're hiring people that are called UX researchers. They're not hiring people that are called human factors researchers. They're looking they're putting an umbrella term of UX with like cog side degrees, human factors people, data scientists, but it's under that UX umbrella. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, any other closing thoughts on this one or can we wrap up and get out of here and tell the tell the listeners how to get uh, a free healthcare symposium ticket? Do it. 
Okay, let's get out of here. So that's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned for the after show. We are having an after show this week. Like I said, it's great. If you want to get in on the ground floor right now, it's a no better time than now. Uh, for the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social channels at 8 Factors Podcast. If you like what you hear, want to support us, like I said, Patreon's the place to be. Uh, or you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice. And, of course, you can always reach us on our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. To enter the contest, all you have to do, there's a link down below. It'll give you a couple different options, like following us on Twitter, following HFES on Twitter, uh, tweeting out once a day, or giving us a review. You can get points all these ways. We'll do the drawing later uh, next month. And then, uh, yeah, you can win You can win a trip to 2019 Healthcare Symposium. So Woo! go do that. I want to thank Mr. Blank Gardenstore for dealing with my terrible outro. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about robot valets? Guys, you can always find me in the Human Factors cast Slack, but you can also find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Uh, special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome, criticizing uh, complex systems. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends! depends.